So, hi everyone, good afternoon. It's so great to see all of you here. And my name is Christine Smith, and I am a pediatrician that's currently practicing in St. Petersburg, Florida. And I have been practicing general pediatrics for a little over 20 years now. And I've been vegan for about 19 years. Um, for me, I first started um, my kind of journey uh, because of animal welfare. I had adopted my first dog, and I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time, which of course is you know on its way to becoming the amazing vegan mecca that it is today. And I was looking at my dog, and I thought, well, why do we eat some animals and not others? And am I okay with that? And my answer was no. So that started me on my personal journey of becoming a vegan. And the first animals I gave up were, of course, our cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys. But I was still eating fish and milk and dairy products, cheese and things like that. But back then, I didn't have a personal computer because, yes, it was that long ago. <laughs> so what I did is I started reading and I got a lot of books and I started learning more about animal agriculture, how it affects our health, our environment, and even its ripple effects that our diet can have on the earth and all of humanity. So that's when I went full force vegan and have been ever since. And my journey has been long and initially, and my friend who's here will laugh, and I was known as a junk food vegan, um, but it's really been in the last several years I've really learned how important a plant-based diet is and not eating so much junk food and the fake meats and processed foods and trying to limit that stuff as much as possible. I also grew up as a child of German immigrants so we were a very meat heavy diet so I didn't really know about beans and eating that way so when I first transitioned I did eat a lot of those you know fake meats and trust me back then they weren't as good as some of the stuff that we have today. Um, so in my personal practice, as I learned more and more, I became very excited to share this information with my patients and their families. And it was always nice to have a family that was really receptive and open to what I was talking about. And I've noticed, especially in the last few years, which is very exciting, is that more and more people are aware and they're more interested and really open to the idea of eating more plants and less animals, even if they don't want to go all the way, and also that they're learning about its effects on the environment, and they care about that because they care about their they care about their children's futures as well. Ten million kids in the United States actually have milk allergies. Milk allergies only second to peanut allergies, and it can cause nausea, vomiting, reflux, eczema, asthma, all these other issues in kids. And so it's just, you know, one less thing for families to have to worry about. And, you know, we don't want these kids to be suffering. And I do see a lot of kids with belly pain and constipation and colicky little kids. And, you know, we really, really makes me sad. And so it's a great opportunity, though, for education. Milk also causes a lot of iron deficiency anemia because it's low in iron. It actually interferes with iron absorption. So that's another reason that we can say, you know, milk does really not do a body good. Um, I'm kind of harping on milk a lot, but it's a big thing, especially in the pediatric population. Uh, we also know that in countries that drink the highest amount of milk, they also have the highest rate of osteoporosis. And in a study in 2012, um, they looked at some uh, teenage athletes, and those that had the highest milk consumption also had the highest number of fractures. So again, it doesn't really make our bones nice and strong like the ads like to show us. And of course, I'm also sure, like I was mentioning before, you know, many of us have heard, we're not baby cows. Um, <laughs> you know, milk is baby cow growth factor. And it's meant to take a 60 pound calf into a 600 pound plus cow. And personally, I say, no thank you. Um, and not only that, but even if you buy hormone free or organic milk, you, you cannot bypass those um, hormones that that pregnant ca cow is having and is sending into the um, milk. And that's one of our highest sources of exogenous hormones in our diets and in my population you know that can even show itself with early puberty not to mention the health effects it can have down the road 
And why don't we know these things? <laughs> well, you know, the dairy industry spends a lot of money. Um, for example, in 2016, the dairy industry spent $6 million, over $6 million on lobbying alone, not to mention advertising and all the other things they do. Plus, they do sponsor a lot of health organizations like the American Heart Association and others. And so sometimes that can skew the information that a lot of these organizations are putting out. So it's always really important to look at those things when you're reading the latest headlines that are coming across the news or on your website sites and things like that. So kids who get calcium again from their plant-based sources, uh, not only do they have better absorption of the calcium, but they're also getting lots of other vitamins and minerals that are really important that you don't get from milk. And not only that, but they're also getting a lot of fiber and fiber is really deficient in the typical standard American diet. So this is also a really great benefit as well. Now the protein question. So growing kids, like toddlers and adolescents, especially really active teenagers, need a little bit more protein in their diet than, say, an adult. So a child would need about 0.5 grams per pound and a teenager about 0.7 grams per pound. So for example, if we took an average three-year-old, they would only need about maybe 14 to 16 grams of protein a day. And you can get that in about a half a cup of lentils one piece of whole grain bread and one tablespoon of an almond or a peanut butter. So that's super easy to do, you know, so it's not really anything to worry about. The average American gets way too much protein in their diet, a lot more than they need, and that usually ends up turning into fat because that's extra calories that we don't need. The other thing I'd like to mention is that, you know, again, getting back to protein sources, when we're getting them from beans and nuts and seeds and grains, again, we're getting those healthy components, again, those vitamins and minerals and fiber and all those things that we really need to be healthy. They've been shown to decrease our risk of cancers and cardiovascular disease. So again, in kids, I want them to grow up to be healthy. And even as adults, if we start doing a plant-based diet, it can reverse a lot of the effects that we may have done through our childhood diets and young adult lives. So picky eating. <laughs> um, even yesterday, I had a mom come in with her four-year-old for their checkup, and she was just so perplexed because he ate all his vegetables when he was a baby, and now that he's four, all he wants is corn. And so it can be a huge dilemma, and it's definitely a conundrum for a lot of parents. But the, the reason for this is many, and what's interesting is taste preferences can actually start very early in age. And I read one study that showed even in the 15th week of pregnancy, test preferences can start. And again, through nursing, um, babies are getting taste through that. And then around five to seven months is when kids have that window of really learning their taste preferences. So a lot of times you say, oh great, you know, I have a five-year-old, a 10-year-old that won't eat. I've kind of missed that window. But that's not really true. They've shown that for kids, 10 to 12 exposures of a food, they'll eventually start eating it again. So every other day, if he doesn't like his broccoli, keep putting it on the plate, and hopefully they'll start to eat that for you. Um, and a lot of times too, with young kids and toddlers, it has to do with the fact that they are, you know, they want control. So since mom wants me to eat the broccoli or dad wants me to eat the cauliflower, I don't want to do that. And also, it may look very different to them. They may have been used to getting their broccoli very squishy and maybe mashed up and now it looks like little trees. And they can get very fearful of things that don't seem familiar to them. So again, patience is key with that. The other things we can do as families to help kids with eating more vegetables and being a little bit more experimental and adventurous with their foods is making meal time a family time so there's no um, you know excessive attention on the child that everyone's eating together and everyone's eating the same thing that's really important too don't become a short order cook it's not good to keep making things over and over again for your kids um, also, if it's age appropriate, have your child help you go grocery shopping or your grandchild help you go grocery shopping. And if they are allowed to help stir or even mash up things together, that's really helpful as well. 
um, do things like taco bars or bowl bars where you have all the ingredients set up and your child can put together what they want and what they like and that can be really helpful as well. They may be more you know, likely to eat something if they played a part in, in getting that food and getting it together. It's also really important to model good behavior. So we all need to eat really healthy as well in front of our kids and our grandkids and show them that's the way to kind of live a healthy life. Um, and when it comes to snacks, you know, choices are good, but not open-ended questions. I always like to joke that if someone said to me, hey, you want a snack? I'd be like, yeah, how about some Oreos? Because they're vegan. <laughs> but what's better with kids is to ask, like, would you rather have an apple or strawberries? And let them pick. Um, in my office, I see a lot of kids eating really fast snacky foods like chips and crackers, goldfish crackers and things like that because it's easy. When your child's hungry, you just want to give them that quick, fast thing. But it's great to have maybe prepared ahead of time raisins, some grapes, a bag of grapes, some cut up carrots, you know, different things like that that you can give your child to, to eat when they're hungry and in those instances. And the last thing I would just like to add is, um, actually two things. One also too is I've seen a lot of things where, um, and I've even told some patients this, is like be sneaky. You know, when you're making that berry smoothie, throw some kale in there and they'll never know it's in there. But kids are pretty smart. So if it tastes a little different than they're used to, they may not want to drink it and then not trust you anymore. So instead, and it sounds kind of silly, but instead you can make their regular smoothie with something interesting in it, like kale and say, hey, I put a secret ingredient in your smoothie today. Can you guess what it is? And so it kind of takes their attention away from it and does something else, okay? And the last thing, if your child um, or grandchild is plant-based, um, vitamin B12 supplementation is super important. Um, B12 uh, is really important for neurological development. It can also cause some anemias if you're deficient. And so I would have um, the families of the kids talk to their pediatrician about dosing for that because it's very different on age, um, as well as vitamin D. Plant milks are actually great sources of vitamin D. They have just as much calcium and vitamin D as, as cow's milk does, but it's better. Um, but, you know, talk to your doctors about that as well because those things are very important. Okay? So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. I guess next we'll have Dr. Patel talk, um, our endocrinologist. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Soham Patel. Um, so as Christine mentioned, I'm an endocrinologist and I uh, treat adults. I don't have any pediatric training, uh, but I see a lot of uh, young diabetics who have probably been diabetic as, as teenagers. And that's not type 1 diabetes, that's type 2 diabetes that I'm talking about. The type of diabetes that was considered uh, diabetes of old age is not there anymore. I can see that kind of diabetes in, I, I've heard from my pediatric friends about 10-year-olds getting type 2 diabetes, and I have my 20- uh, and 18-year-old patients with type 2 diabetes. So diabetes, uh, which used to be based on age classification, has not been there anymore. But taking a step back, so I uh, grew up as a lacto-vegetarian. Um, I grew up in India and uh, did my schooling and med school all there before coming here. and. Um, thinking that I'm eating a vegetarian diet had a false sense of uh, security in my mind that I'm eating healthy, which I was eating healthy than a lot of other people, but still there was a lot of improvement to be done. Uh, my biggest issue was having milk and yogurt. I didn't care much for cheese. Cheese was a, a periodic uh, intake, but milk and yogurt uh, were my big uh, to go things, I would go through three glasses of milk a day and uh, literally a pound of yogurt every day, homemade yogurt. And uh, I grew up in India where uh, the part of India that is very, very hot, uh, summer would be 120 degrees and uh, winter would be 70 degrees. So in summertime, we were sweating so much that you needed something to hydrate. So I would drink a lot of buttermilk, which was basically yogurt milk uh, mixed with uh, water and some spices. And, and that, that was my form of hydration. So I kept doing that for many years, so close to 30 years. And, and I actually 
blame myself for not picking up on skipping dairy earlier because my grandfather who was an engineer by training but spent a lot of hours reading books and learning from other uh, physicians had been following naturopathic principles almost all his adult life and he kept telling me that you don't need your day milk you can get your calcium from the leafy greens and beans and somehow cognitive dissonance whatever you call it I, I blocked that advice for so many years that uh, didn't pay attention kept doing what I was doing because I felt safe that I'm vegetarian so I'm, I'm, I'm eating healthy so till I ended up in my fellowship uh, in my endocrine fellowship I started pulling up the different studies that he was talking about and um, I started getting surprised and uh, amazed by the strength and the uh, amount of evidence scientific evidence so I decided one dinner day a dinner table uh, in November 2014 that I'm not gonna have my dairy anymore so I went from having three glasses of milk and a pound of yogurt every day to none and my wife and my parents they all agreed but they in their mind they were saying he's not gonna go through this it may last maybe a couple days or maybe a week and I was personally surprised that I was able to go through no dairy eating more food in place of the no dairy and no exercise I was not exercising at that time and I still lost 20 pounds just like that in three weeks so I said sounds like it can be gone I, I stopped my dairy so I started eating a little bit of Chobani plain unsweetened Greek yogurt for lunch every day for a week and I gained back five pounds in a week I stopped it again it came off again and my weight has stayed the same I've, I've added exercise and resistance training to my regimen so I built more muscle mass and I've still lost more fat mass but my weight stays the same uh, my energy level went up uh, afternoons were a big drag before after lunch I would feel like when will the day end but now I can eat a lot of food and still not feel sleepy I can uh, you know feel less bloated I was uh, having a lot of GI issues earlier constipation and bloating and, and all that has gone away I've reached a point where if I so I, I'll give you one more experience so three months after I had quit dairy completely I was at a friend's place and they had made fruit custard which used to be my favorite dessert made from milk and cream and sugar and fruits and so I was tempted to have that I had a bowl of it and, and that night I was up with vomiting and diarrhea and stomach upset so the food which I was happily gulping through all my early uh, teenage and adult years I had hard time just in three months what changed was my microbiome had changed so we carry a lot of bacteria from one end to the other end we carry trillions and trillions of bacteria if we just look at number of cells we are only half human and half bacterial so the type of microbiome that we carry is very important in terms of staying healthy because if we have the wrong type, wrong type of bacteria then it leads to more heart disease and more stroke and more cancer more diabetes more weight issues all kinds of things how we think our mood can be determined by the type of our microbiome we make more serotonin and dopamine which are the feel-good chemicals in the brain we make more of those in the gut if we have the right microbiome than what we would make in the brain so what changed in those three months is my microbiome because of all the fiber foods which I was already eating before started working because there was no more dairy and the high fat and animal protein blocking those effect of the fiber foods I was eating earlier so when I did have something from made from dairy it really showed me the difference what it was doing to me over time so I would urge every one of you to you know go on your own journey of exploration it's an adventure journey don't look at it as, as a stressful uh, change and, and you don't have to go 100% you, you can start with one thing if you want you can go all the way you will see more changes if you go all the way but it doesn't mean if you don't go all the way you don't see changes the extent of change will determine the extent of your benefits so that's that's something I always share with my patients is 
yes, we have a goal to reach, but everyone has a different pace. You can go very fast or you can go steadily up. The goal is to decide a pace that you are comfortable sustaining. That's the key. It would rather be okay to not be fully plant-based, but keep changing every week, every month, and reaching that in six months, than going 100% plant-based, and then getting uh, more stressed on how to plan your meals, and get more overwhelmed, and stop doing it after a month. That doesn't help us. So, so try to chart your own trajectory and try to make a sustainable change that you can carry forward and it becomes your new normal. Then your body tells you things like I just shared the three month experience that it will prevent you from faulting away from your plant based eating. And like Christian mentioned, you can be doing good for the environment, you can be doing good for the animals, you can be doing good ethically and morally. You don't have to do bad for your health by eating vegan junk food. So I always, you know, when I talk to my patients, uh, I ask them about their food. And the first thing they say, oh, I eat healthy, I eat clean, or I eat vegetarian, or I eat vegan. I said, you're saying what you don't eat. I don't know what you do eat. And I'm, I'm borrowing that from uh, Dr. Reddy, who is a cardiologist, uh, he's sitting right back there. But uh, that's, that's a nice way to put it. So the, what you want to have the perspective is, you know, what you're eating is what you're getting. So don't get into, uh, uh, you know, putting labels, but focus on what nutrient rich foods you're eating. Higher the nutrients, higher the fiber, better the quality of the food. And the American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, which is uh, a professional association that I'm a member of, and it puts out guidelines every year, every few years. And 2018 guidelines from ACE about diabetes, uh, and this is about uh, focusing on type 2 diabetes, clearly says in the lifestyle modification, which is the first step, which hardly gets focused on by physicians, sadly. <laughs> but that's, that's changing slowly. But for the most part, lifestyle is either at the most a handout that you get at the end of the visit, or one-liner, eat less, exercise more, which is not scientifically true, actually. So the first fundamental change in that uh, guideline says you need to eat a primarily plant-based diet. That's in the guidelines, but that's not what the uh, people hear from their physicians. And I'm working on changing that when I talk to my fellow endocrinologist, and we have an interest group going there. So. It's slowly and steadily changing, but we are not there yet. So you need to be the stewards of your own health to educate yourself and then bring it up to your physicians. And if you find your physicians are not supporting you in your journey to eat better, then you may want to start looking for other physicians who can do that. I'm not trying to badmouth anybody here, but you don't need to be in a situation where you're trying to do better for your health and you're getting a mixed message from your physician or you're getting lack of support and you feel confused and you go back to doing what you're doing before and that's not what you want to do. So common questions that I see in my practice is, oh I need to eat more protein and fat, I need to avoid my carbohydrates because I have diabetes. When I talk about fruits, oh fruits have all this sugar, well fruits come in a package. So always look at food as a package. Is that a package with all positives and very little or no negatives? Or is it a package with one good thing and a lot of negative things? So example, eating an orange or two oranges is a lot better than gulping through an eight ounce glass of orange juice. You can gulp six oranges or five oranges worth of juice in those eight ounces versus if I ask you to six, eat six oranges, you would not eat them, you would at the most eat maybe two. And that's because the fiber in the fruit and the different phytonutrients and the different minerals, they make you satiated, they prevent you from eating more. So automatically you control the amount of fructose, the sugar from fruit that you're getting. Yes, it's true that fructose can only be processed by your liver and too much of fructose can be a problem, but if you're eating it in form of a fruit, 
the fruit automatically controls the amount of fructose that you're going to be eating and so it's not any concern but if you're trying to drink juices fresh squeezed whatever fruit juice is not better but you want to eat the actual fruit and let the fruit fiber control the amount of fruit that you would eat the other common question I always find is oh beans have carbohydrates oh cereals have carbohydrates well carbohydrates are the fuel that drives us that guy that that promotes energy to all our cells we are designed in a way the Krebs cycle if you remember your biochemistry classes is is how the glucose molecule gets processed and it generates an energy molecule called ATP every reaction that happens in the body uses ATP so ATP uh, is how we measure our energy status and glucose when it's oxidized in the cell generates the most amount of ATP versus if you use a fat molecule to oxidize and generate ATP it's it's way less efficient so glucose is the primary fuel that your body needs your brain which consumes 20 percent of the glucose that you have through the day is a very active organ so when you try to eat a low carb diet or a keto diet or all these different names south beach and atkins and blood group diet and paleo diet and pagan i don't know what that means but <laughs> all kinds of names you find when you restrict the amount of carbohydrates you eat you may feel okay for a while but over time with all that extra fat and protein which most of the times is coming from animal sources is going to clog up your cells and reach a state where you will actually start gaining weight back that you lost you will be feeling bad you won't get have the energy we actually call it keto flu there's a condition described called keto flu which is like flu but because you're doing keto diet you really gunged up your body's metabolism that you're actually feeling beaten down like you have having flu bomb from doing keto so uh, in in six months to a year mark you can actually go back to where you were in terms of the weight you would actually increase your risk of heart disease and cancer and in terms of diabetes you may not see the sugar running high because you're not eating any carbohydrates but as soon as you eat a piece of fruit because all your liver cells and muscle cells are gunged up with fat and protein it's going to give you a big sugar spike so instead it is better to eat whole food plant-based where you're eating vegetables and beans and fruits and whole grains which are loaded with fiber and nutrients and minerals yes they have the complex carbohydrates but they also come with a lot of protein every whole grain has protein every vegetable has protein every bean has protein every nut and seed has protein even fruits if you eat a cup of blueberries it has two grams of protein if you eat a mango it has two grams of protein so the idea is to eat the variety of foods and get all the combination fat protein carbohydrate everybody talks about it but we also need fiber vitamins minerals and water we need seven things so you look at a package if it has seven things you eat that if it only has one thing of those seven you skip that so eat whole plant foods and try to eat in a certain time of the day we are not good in processing food at night so having food between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. having more heavier meals in the middle or early part of the day then eating lot at dinner is going to make an impact so try to eat heavier breakfast and lunch but a lighter dinner and skip no food between 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. you will feel a lot lighter your body would process things better and fasting has been part of uh, different cultures and civilizations for centuries and millennia it's nothing new we have a word called intermittent fasting now from all this recent scientific stuff but it's been been done for ages so follow your gut that sense that expression that follow your gut is, is actually scientifically true because if you eat the right foods you'll have the right bacteria which will give you the right dopamine and serotonin which will give you the right thoughts so follow your gut eat whole plant foods not too much and uh, that's that's with well and my talk here thank you
I'm with Advent Health and Celebration in downtown Orlando. So my uh, plant-based journey began early on. So I grew up on a farm and we weren't farmers, but we had land and we let people keep cows on our land. And can you hear me? I don't get a whole lot louder than this. <laughs> so grew up on a farm. We had some cows. We ate cows that ate grass that weren't injected with anything. And that was kind of how I grew up. And I went away to college and started eating the meat in the cafeteria and thought, this is not the same beef. What's wrong with this beef versus my beef at home? and really started learning about nutrition at that point when I was studying to be an engineer of all things. So that continued throughout my medical career and I was just amazed at the fact that we got no education in terms of nutrition in medical school and I literally didn't have one hour in my, my medical curriculum and I went to Indiana University which is a very good medical school um, so I thought, well, you know, I guess they're just not going to mention this. And I studied it alongside on my own. And I really, really wanted to get out of Indiana. So I ended up in Miami for my residency in radiation oncology. And I connected with a group of physicians there studying functional medicine. So that continued. And I still was amazed that even in my residency, nobody was mentioning the importance of nutrition in cancer patients. And we were in fact telling our patients, well, eat whatever you want, eat a lot of it, and please don't lose any weight because you're a cancer patient and that means that you're not doing very well if you're losing weight. So I didn't believe any of this, but here I am a resident. I'm not about to really change the system. But I did continue to practice with my patients on my services, plant-based nutrition. And when I took my job at Moffitt, I've married the two ever since. So in my patients, I not only help them treat their breast cancer with radiation, but I marry the two. So I make sure that we are emphasizing the importance of nutrition and physical activity, mindfulness, um, stress reduction techniques. So that's a big um, component of cancer care, or should be, and sleep quality. Um, so in terms of the data, I'll give you some pretty impressive numbers. So if you are maintaining a healthy body weight, okay, and you're eating at least five fruits and vegetables a day, and you're getting about 30 minutes of moderate physical activity per day, you will reduce your incidence of all cancers by at least a third. So that's a huge number. If we had chemo that would do that consistently, it would be in the water, okay? But this is broccoli and chickpeas. If you have breast cancer and you do those things, in addition to, of course, you can't be a smoker, we all know not to smoke, you'll reduce your risk of death from breast cancer by 50%. So these are better numbers than we can give you with a lot of our conventional therapies. And now I'm not an advocate for alternative treatment of breast cancer because by the time you've been diagnosed with breast cancer, something's already gone awry. We have a problem that we need a little extra help dealing with. But to reduce your risk of recurrence, these are certainly your most powerful tools. So in my patients, we usually begin with an assessment and I, you know, dig deep and ask them, what are you actually eating every day? What are you doing every day? What do you feel like your stress um, looks like? Are you sleeping well? When are you eating throughout the day? And then we try to fine tune where we can you know, make improvements. So in general, <clears throat> I encourage a whole food plant-based diet, just like we've all been preaching. So you wanna eat as close to the original form of that food. So rather than an apple pie, which can be delicious, you're eating an apple, okay? And you get the idea. Um, there are some specific foods that have more activity against breast cancer stem cells. So I have my patients, you know, try to load up on the berries, the dark leafy greens, um, turmeric, green tea, green apples especially. Um, so there are some things that I say, you know, emphasize these, try to get them in throughout your week, but don't make it too complicated. Um, physical activity is incredibly important in breast cancer specifically. So you do want to get that 30 minutes a day of moderate physical activity. And that means that you are walking along or on the bike or on the whatever, and you can't sing a song. <clears throat> if you can belt out a few words, 
fine, but if you can sing a song, you're not moving fast enough. So that's kind of your goal, a minimum of 30 minutes a day. Strength training is important in addition to that. So it's easy for us to get in the gym and figure out how to you know, turn on a cardio machine, but strength training is a lot more intimidating. Um, so I always recommend to my patients to go to a certain few practitioners that I work with and they show them how you know, to lift and how to use your muscles and how to really strengthen your body, focusing more on functional movements. Um, stress reduction is key. Now, we cannot remove stress from our lives, obviously, that's impossible. We all have things that, that stress us, but we can revise the way that we deal with stress and work on a mindfulness practice. And, you know, we just, Soham and I actually just took the Lifestyle Medicine board exam recently, and <clears throat> we're board certified in this now. And uh, I don't know, have you, have you done that as well? You would love it, you've gotta do it. You are doing it already, so you might as well. Um, and in the, in the board review book, I was really impressed by their definition of mindfulness. And it was, mindfulness is awareness of the space between the stimulus and the response. And I thought it was really nice and succinct and, and nicely sums up, you know, what I try to tell my patients. Um, so we work on that, you know, and that's different for everybody. And it might be just simple quiet time. You know, we don't get quiet time anymore. And time when you don't have your electronics around you and you're just there with yourself and your thoughts. Um, so maybe it's formal meditation, maybe it's deep breathing, you know, maybe you do want some sort of relaxing music. But developing a daily practice really does a lot for your body. And what we're after with all of these things is to turn your body into a cancer-fighting machine. So we want to lower inflammation, we want to make your gut microbiome happy, we want to boost your immune system, so that in the future, when you have a cancer cell floating around your body, like we all do from time to time, your immune system takes care of it before we ever find out about it, and we don't meet to talk about radiation for breast cancer. So that is the ultimate goal in, in everything we do. Um, some of the common questions that I get in the breast cancer world, soy is a big one. Um, that's probably the biggest one and the biggest area of confusion. So all of my patients almost universally come to me and they say, Dr. Orman, your good friend Dr. X told me not to eat soy because I have an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And I say, he means nothing but good. He has the best of intentions. He's just not aware of the data. And I share the data. And the fact is that all of the human data in soy and breast cancer shows that soy will reduce your risk of getting breast cancer if you've never had it. And if you have it, it'll actually reduce your risk of death from breast cancer. And it works because a breast cancer cell has two types of estrogen receptors, okay? Plant estrogen from soy binds to one, and our estrogen from our body binds to another. The plant estrogen turns that breast cancer cell off. Our estrogen revs it up. So if you're a breast cancer patient and you're not eating good whole food organic soy, like um, tempeh is a fabulous source, tofu, um, soy milk made out of whole soybeans, if you're not consuming those things because you're scared, because you've been told by your neighbor or your cousin or your doctor that it's bad for you, they're actually uh, false, okay? And it is a fabulous way to reduce your risk of breast cancer recurrence, okay? Um, I'd really like to give you guys time to ask questions. I think that that is where we find real value in these talks. So I'm gonna stop now and uh, I don't know if they have some microphones, but just raise your hands. We'll be sure to repeat your question so that everybody else can hear. Okay? We have prostate cancer, so I same So prostate cancer is very similar to breast cancer. It's like the breast cancer for men. But men can also get breast cancer, by the way, and I see that um, because I, I specialize in it. Um, soy will actually reduce your risk of prostate cancer as well. And there's some interesting data um, by Dr. Ornish showing that in men with early, early stage prostate cancer, right, that don't, they could, they can go on a program called active surveillance, basically where we're just monitoring, does it, is it gonna get bad enough that it needs treatment or not? 
they showed that they could change the gene expression, okay, within prostatic tissue and tumor tissue with this lifestyle. So whole food, plant-based lifestyle, physical activity, stress reduction, social connectedness, all of these things. So it does work. And, you know, all of these things we talk about, diabetes, heart disease, you know, all, all of these chronic diseases, um, heart disease especially, that kills more people than all the cancers combined. They all have a similar etiology and it's inflammation. And that inflammation is created from, it's, it's, our, it's our lifestyle related, okay? And in terms of breast cancer, five, maybe 10% of them are actually genetic. And even in those people, you can modify your risk with your lifestyle. So, you know, we really have to embrace the fact that we have a lot of control over our health. Um, it's not up to our genes. It's up to us and what we're putting in our body and doing with our body and exposing ourselves to. Um, so I think, you know, arming yourself with that knowledge is invaluable for you and your family. Dr. Esselstyn has been known to say to his audiences, no oil, no oil. So there's a lot of vegans in here and I know that you eat pretty healthy. Can you help us tackle a bit of the oil question and you know, some of the exceptions about oil being healthy? Yeah, so, and I'll let you guys speak to this as well. If you have anything to add, please. Um, you know, I think of this as oil is taking the fat, okay? We do need fat in our diet um, in, in small amounts. It is a super, super concentrated fat, right? So you've taken the olive, which has all those phytonutrients, the fiber, all of these amazing things in it. You've gotten rid of all the good stuff and you've concentrated the fat, okay? And it's just, it's so accessible to your body. So when you take it into your body, it's immediately there in its purest form. And your body doesn't have to do anything to it. All it's getting is calories from fat. So that's something that I've done in the, probably the last two years. I've really pulled oil out of our diet. And even though my husband and our family, our three kids, we're all plant-based, we all eat like this. I know particularly my husband and I have noticed a difference in the way that we feel. And we thought we were like, you know, tuned up to the max, couldn't really do anything better. But I can tell you that I personally feel better when I'm not consuming oil. And now when I'm out, you know, when you're out eating out, you can't control everything. Things are gonna be prepared in oil. If you ask a chef not to use oil, like their head might explode. So <laughs> it's sometimes you have to consume some oil and I can tell when I do it. So it's just another level. And I think it also depends on what is your goal. If you are, you know, if you've got, if you're very overweight, you're on a statin for your cholesterol, you got high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you've got a stent, you've had an MI, you know, you need to really tune it up. You need to really be on your best behavior, whole food, plant-based diet, you know, as low oil as possible to help you reverse that as quickly as possible. So you have less a capacity to deal with those things in terms of what your body needs. So, yes. In terms of uh, hormones, your body functions differently on a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet. I've heard that some doctors say too much soy is not good for you. Yeah, so I'm going to let Dr. Patel talk to you about the endocrinology, endocrinologic um, implications of high soy diet, if you have anything to, to add for that. In terms of, you know, it's, <coughs> it, it depends on what type of soy you're talking about. So we want to get away from soy isolates. You want to eat organic whole soy, okay, as close to its natural form as possible. But it's actually going to do a lot of things for your for your blood work, it helps lower cholesterol specifically. Um, there's a great trial um, 
looking at a, a high soy plant-based diet where that was specifically included and that diet was as effective as a stat in a short amount of time in terms of lowering your your bad cholesterol um do you have anything to add about thyroid levels and things like this so in terms of uh, as uh, amber mentioned that when you go for eating soy foods you want to eat foods which are wholesome soy products so non-gmo organic soybeans or edamame beans or tofu or tempeh or uh, whole soy milk you know made from organic beans you don't want to go into any processed uh, soy products now the idea is to create balance if you're just eating soy tofu and tempeh and soy beans and nothing else through your week of food then that can sometimes create some you know changes on your blood work so don't go into extremes of uh, just soy and nothing else but soy beans in their wholesome form should be part of a combination of your beans and vegetables and fruits and whole grains uh, even nuts and seeds have phytoestrogens so it's not just soy beans other beans also have a little bit of phytoestrogens uh, apricots and figs uh, and different other uh, tree nuts also have phytoestrogens so it's about having the variety of foods and not just focusing on one aspect uh, to my knowledge i haven't seen any thyroid hormone changes with soy products but uh, back in my fellowship i did have a patient who was using soy milk and soy oil and all processed soy fake meats and just everything was soy 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 and uh, they did have issues with that testosterone level and estrogen level having a little imbalance so the idea is to keep the balance not shy away from eating soy foods but focus on eating wholesome organic non gmo soy foods and and not just uh, pick on that and nothing else have the variety